Hey, can you remind everybody this is National Leave the Office Early Day? They already left? Well, excellent. Good morning, afternoon, or evening. You are listening to the Professional Noticer. Well, for my money, he's got all the facial characteristics of a criminal. Here, you and I will use common sense and all the wisdom we can muster to move beyond what is true and go all the way to the truth. California, Georgia, Puerto Rico. With actual listeners in more than a hundred countries, I am the professional noticer. You know, the, the narrow chin and the eyes close together. And... Hello, everyone. I'm Andy Andrews. Hey, thank you for making me a part of your week. As the professional noticer, it's my job to professionally notice things. <laughs> and nothing's off limits. If you got questions about business, spiritual issues, popular culture, it doesn't matter. We're all over the board. We even tackle odd conundrums like, imagine you're in a room that's filling up with water quickly. There are no windows or doors. How do you get out? Well, stop imagining, obviously. <laughs> Look, my purpose here today and with every show we do is to play the part of a best friend or coach. I want to help you live the life you would live if all your toughest questions were answered. Our sponsor this week is AustinLegacyKnives.com. Austin Legacy Knives makes one-of-a-kind knives. In fact, on the blade, each one is discreetly marked one of one. And for the Father's Day special, Austin Legacy Knives, Austin has taken the, the desk and chair, the table and chair that I wrote the Traveler's Gift on uh, 15, 16 years ago. And uh, he has taken this and taken the wood and used it to make the handle in this beautiful pocket knife that he calls the Traveler. And for you, right now, until Father's Day, there's a special uh, price. And you, you can go on AustinLegacyKnives.com and look at the Traveler. But it's a one-of-a-kind thing. The special price, $99. Okay, this is way down from the usual price. But just for Father's Day, what a unique gift for Dad. And uh, this will be something he'll displace. And it, it is also something nobody will walk in and go, yeah, I got one of those. There are not very many of them. And once the wood has gone from the chair and the table, um, the knives are no more. These are, these are uh, not just limited editions. They're works of art. Okay, so AustinLegacyKnives.com. Observations and answers are what we do here. Uh, the professional noticer and you know the we, we're tilting strongly toward the observations part uh, lately and, and especially today I have on as our guest with the professional noticer a friend of mine but I'm just telling you you probably already know who this is because you listen to him on Sirius you listen to him on the dry bar comedy uh, but uh, I would like to introduce those of you who don't know to what I consider the very best working comedian today. This is Jeff Allen. Hey, Jeff, how are you? Good, Andrew. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. And I'm serious, man. I tell everybody this. I, I was uh, talking with uh, Mark Lowry the other day. And we were talking about comedians and just who we like. And I said, well, I said, you know Jeff Allen. He said, I do. I said, Jeff Allen is the best technical comedian I, I've ever seen and the very best working today. So what do you think about that, brother? Well, that's a lot of pressure. Um, you know, it's like uh, my granddaughter said to me last night, she's seven years old. She looks at me, she goes, make me laugh, Papa. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, I get paid to make people laugh and I'm not going to do that. That kind of pressure is that, you know, she had her arms folded and she said, make me laugh. So that's the, anyway. that is the comedian's curse. You know, having right. worked as a comedian, uh, that's just kind of what people do, isn't it? Some it, people. It, yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're even remotely serious, people are kind of like, you know, seem very funny to me. It's like I, right. I'm off. I always, you know? I always tell audiences right up front, man. Uh, if you keep your expectations low enough, I'll meet every one of them, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but people yeah. coming up and saying that, 
I think I think comedy is probably the only profession people do that. Nobody ever goes up to you know a a, a doctor and says, right. "Hey, will you look down my throat or something." Right. Hey, you know. Yeah, I used to but, always say, you know, lawyers don't, you know, people don't come up to a lawyer at a party. Hey, I got a great closing argument for your next trial. <laughs> <laughs> but God, yeah. how many times yeah. d- does it, and, and I, you know, I know we're probably talking about something, we're probably just like giving this away here, but how many times do you sit through jokes that you've heard a jillion times and you're thinking, please, come on, come on, come on, because they just, they can't tell a joke. Right. It's just, and I always tell them, I give them the Shakespeare line afterward, you know, brevity is the solo wit. (laughs) It it is amazing to me. And years ago, there's a guy named Peter Gensimer on, uh, when I worked on the cruise ship and, and we kind of figured out what people say when a joke is not funny. You, You know what it is, don't you? When, some, yeah. when somebody tells you a joke and it's not – if somebody tells you a joke and it's funny, people just laugh. But if somebody tells you a joke and it's not funny, what we all do is go, <laughs> that's funny. That's right. funny. <laughs> yeah, and very so good. Yeah. It, start, it started to be kind of this private thing between, between us on the ship because people would tell us jokes and we would look at each other and go, no, that's funny. That's funny. Right. And, and, and they had, <laughs> and they had no idea we were laugh. saying – yeah, that would make yeah, you guys. Yeah, it laugh. would make us. Laugh. They yeah. had no idea we were saying that wasn't funny at all. Yeah. So, but, hey, so who do you? First of all, first of all, let me ask you this: How's Tammy? How's your family? Everybody's great. Everybody's great. We're uh, we're actually waiting for the uh, uh, serology test to be approved here in Tennessee, so that we can see. She, we went through something in December. Um, very uh every symptom uh she was knocked out man she had um she got tested twice for the flu she didn't test positive um she ended up with pneumonia and bronchitis and uh all she kept saying for for a month was this will not break up it's this uh, they kept giving her expectorants and um anti- antibiotics and uh, they ended up giving her a nebulizer and, a, and an inhaler uh, more than once, Andy, I'm telling you, I, I'm leaving the room and she'd start coughing and she would literally drop to her knees gulping for air. Um, and this uh. went on, this went on like that for at least two, three weeks. And then eventually she got to where she could walk across the house. She would walk from the kitchen to the living room, sit in a chair, get her breath and then walk to the bedroom. So we're kind of just waiting for the antibody test for this. Um, but she's a she's a smoker for forty years, and she finally quit. But she's in a high risk, you know. And that's my biggest fear. I don't have a problem. I've been out. My whole life hasn't changed, other than the fact that I'm not working. You know, right? Right. I'm golfing yeah, three days. All- I'm golfing three days a week. I'm going out to to get pick up carry out every night I can. Uh, you know, if we if we had restaurants we could eat in, we'd go to them. Um, you know, I, I the funniest thing. Uh, this is how we've lost our minds. McDonald's and, and the town next door to us uh, opened up. You can walk inside, right, and order food. Right. So I need to use their Wi-Fi. I live in the country. I, I can't upload videos. I had some promotional videos for some upcoming events we got, and uh, I can't. It takes me a day and a half to upload a, a 150 <laughs> megabytes. So I'm not kidding you. I'll, I'll hit the you know uh, upload. And we we transfer starts one percent, and it sits there for like eight minutes <laughs> at one percent. Oh my gosh! So I got to go to McDonald's to upload videos. So anyway, uh, I go to McDonald's, um, and uh, they let me in. I order an oatmeal. I stand in line <laughs> for five minutes. I sit down and I start uploading a video. And after a few minutes, some kid comes running by and just panic. Oh, you can't sit here! You can't sit here! You got to get out. And I go, wait a minute, let me understand this. So we're all on the same page. All the germs I've been inhaling, I've been inhaling for the last 10 minutes. They're different over here where I'm sitting. <laughs> right? Are you kidding me? Shut the you, door. What, Don't what let anybody the in the place. And I just well, they opened. The, yeah. Well, that's what I said to the I, you know, And I walked out and there was people in line. I go, we've lost our stinking minds. We really have. And I, I wish I had a dollar for everybody I saw with a mask on where their nose was exposed. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. Getting getting ready, I, you know, I'm having a, a a a procedure done on my neck, and when I was talking to the nurse about what I'm taking, and everything, she's holding the bottom of the mask and holding it away from her face. I mean, the entire right. time. So I'm like, that's, I'm not sure right. that's working. I, yeah, I, I but, know. And why don't we all just put you know helmets on when we drive our cars? Because you know that would save you know. Lives well, well, that's coming. That's coming. I mean, you didn't you didn't used to wear a helmet when you rode your bike, right? Yeah, I. I, I and so, what I think is coming that's going to be sickening is that this next flu season they're going to keep a body count on the nightly news, you know. And um, oh. I just, uh, I, I, again, you sound like a cold hearted jerk when you just say, you know, get on with your life. <laughs> you want to stay home, stay home. But let the rest of us just go out and live, you know. Yeah, I was in a, a big box store uh, the other day. How and dare I was you? Checking man. out. Don't you have any, yeah, I know. I know. I know. But uh, I was I was wearing a mask. I was wearing a mask, oh. and um, and I was in line, and the some manager lady comes by and says, "Sir, please," because I was not standing on my X, and, <laughs> and and she says, "Sir, please stand on the X," and I said, "No, thank you." And she said, sir, and and now everybody's looking. Right. You know, and, and she said, sir, I need you to stand on your ex. And I had on a hat and I had on my mask. Yeah. And this is local. And and I said, um, thank you, but no. And she leans in and looks at me, looks in my eyes, and she says, you're Andy Andrews, aren't you? And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, are you trying to cause a problem here? And I said, no, ma'am. And she said, well, then for God's sakes, why won't you stand on your ex? And I said, look, I've watched way too many Roadrunner cartoons growing up to be dumb enough to stand on an ex. <laughs> and and everybody, everybody around me laughed. And I, I looked and everybody stepped off of their ex. And to her credit, the manager laughed too. Well, and, that's uh, great, but. Man. But good grief, good grief! These are, I think, hey. these are all the former patrol boys. Remember them? You know? Oh yeah. Nobody oh, yeah. liked them. They would stand out there and direct you. They'd stop you from crossing the street when there were no cars coming. Uh, you know, and uh, they nobody liked the patrol boys. And I think these are the they call them Karens on uh, Twitter. That's the. Name. <laughs> yeah, they're, 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 I've got. I, I always think of that as the Barney Five syndrome. You know, it's like it's like this authority thing, and you see it you see it a lot with security guards. Um, but but it's an authority thing. It's like you know, I've never right. had any authority in my entire life, right? And so I've got some now. And by God, if you cross this ten foot section of land that I'm standing in, you're going to have some problems. It's, yeah, it's I've like had it. Barney Fife. Yeah, I've had it with a couple flight attendants over the years. And I remember I specifically bought a computer bag that fit under the the seats on those commuter jets. That's why I bought it. I asked right. the guy at the thing, does this fit under the chair and the commuter jets? And they said, it does. And I said, great. That's all I want. And so anyway, second flight, I'm, I'm carrying it on. She goes, you need to check that. I go, well, it'll fit under the chair. She goes, no, it won't. I go, yes, it will. I said, I specifically bought it. She says, it won't. And we get into this like bow up. This is, it was getting nasty. And anyway, I ended up checking it. I had to take my computer out and all my electronics out because I didn't want them underneath the thing. And um, anyway, because of my AA upbringing, you know, <laughs> I need to I need to do an eighth step or ninth step. I need to admit when I'm wrong. I I, I said some snotty things to her that were over the top um, because it was six thirty <laughs> in the morning, and uh, I'm, and Tammy wasn't with you. And I, yeah, right. And I'm ticked off anyway because the bag was two hundred plus dollars. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Oh my god! And, and I, I got the um, anyway. Probably twenty minutes into the flight, I grabbed her on the way by and I said, "Look, I want to apologize for the way I handled that whole thing." And she stopped dead in her tracks, looked at me, and said, "Wow, you're the first. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to say, you know, you again, the thoughts pop into your head. Well, if you treat other passengers the way you treat me, you know, then I, I, right. I can believe that." <laughs> you know, and I want to also say the bag will fit under the chair if you would just have given me a minute 
to stick it under there. And, uh, but that, that's that, um, that authority thing, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. You know where you made your mistake, don't you? You know where you made your mistake? You made your mistake by stopping, by stopping. Just, you just should have kept walking, Jeffrey. You know, I am at that age, at that age where I can pretend not to hear anything. (laughs) You know, yeah, yeah. And I'm old enough I, now. I've, had, they, I've had those. I have had those conversations because I. I mean, when they started, you know, one of the best three years and one of the worst three years of my life was when I was touring with um, uh, women of faith, and and the reason I say it's one of my best three years is because it, it was just an incredible tour, and I got to be with Patsy Claremont all the time, who I just. She's just like the greatest woman communicator and one of the top three speakers I've ever seen in my life. Wow. And so that was great. But the reason it was one of the worst is because, you know, they would send these cars to pick us up. And there was always one of the other speakers on the on the plane, you know, w- right. with me somewhere. And so that means both of us are riding. Well, I was the only guy on the whole tour. And I I haven't checked anything in years. I mean, if I go to Europe for three weeks, I'm not checking anything. <laughs> I don't care. That's you great. know, I, I'll buy it there. I'll throw my underwear away. I don't care. I'm just not checking anything. But but with those ladies, they check. And so you, you talk about adding an hour to every day waiting right. at baggage claim with those ladies from Women of Faith. But um, yeah, I've had some of those conversations. With those people now, I want to tell you here. I'll tell you a secret. I probably should not say this on the air. Um, I should probably tell you off the air, but um, because I, I hope this, I hope, I hope may, maybe no flight attendants listen to my podcast. But I have because you, know, you know they came up with this rule now that you can't even put your computer in the seat back in front of you. Right, because that's yeah, right. When the plane hits the mountain. Uh, you know, you might jack your knee. <laughs> yeah, I, I just, I don't, I just don't get it. I mean, I'm fine with some kind of normal uh, rules, okay? But when you do stuff like that, I mean, it, it, and it's just like flying now. You, you know, you can, you can't carry, you know, uh, a pocket knife thing. You can't carry nail clippers that fold out. You know, now you can have two 12 inch steel knitting needles. Yeah, my wife you know. carries her crochet needles. <laughs> right. Okay. And so you can't put your your uh, computer in the seat back in front of you. Now you can put a book in there. Well, there is a company called 12 South, and they're in Nashville. They're up near where you are. And they make a computer cover that looks like an old book. Really? And it has on the spine of it, it says, book, book. And then it's (laughs) X11, and it looks like a book, and it's a computer cover. And I've carried that thing around for three years. I have a couple of times I've had flight attendants say, that is a beautiful old book. And I say, yes, thank you. All right, it is. Yes. And I had one <laughs> flight attendant one time that said, is that your computer? And I pulled it out and I pointed to the word and I said, this is a book. See right here, it says book. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's just, it's it's an awesome, well, it's I an awesome Nashville, thing. So I'll have to check it out. Oh, yeah, man. It's great. Nashville is also the place of my, uh, probably one of my most infuriating airport stories is uh, we had a mechanical trying to get somewhere else. And we're, you know, they're stuck at the gate. And, you know, they're they're saying we have a problem and we've called and the person that can handle this. Now, I'm not making this up. When I get to this, you're you're going to you're going to immediately think, ah, you're you're making this up. I'm not making this up. And they said the person, it was on a Sunday, and they said the person that handles this is across town but is on the way. And so we will get this handled. And so we we wait for two hours. Everybody's missing their connections. We wait for two hours, and as God is my witness, Jeff, this guy comes on the plane 
in his maintenance person suit and he has a roll of duct tape. And we all kind of look <laughs> around and the guy goes back a few rows behind me and starts duct taping a bin that won't close, an overhead bin that won't close. And we all kind of look around and I and I said, Are are you serious? This is this is why we and yes, right. you know, it has to be done. And so I got up. And I took a picture of the guy doing it. And a flight attendant comes up to me and says, sir, are you taking a picture of that? I said, I absolutely am. <laughs> right. And I've got a picture of it. And it's, it's just insane. Yeah. So, I had, uh, we had the coffee pot. Um, we, I missed a, um, an interview in Virginia. I was in California with Tammy. And this is the first time she's flown since 9-11. And, um, we, we got delayed because of a coffee pot and ended up taking another flight because they wouldn't let the plane leave because the coffee pot. <laughs> and I wanted to stand up in the middle of the flight go, anybody can go four hours without a cup of coffee? Anybody? Anybody? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, uh, but Tammy, we were, we were going through TSA. First time she's ever been through TSA since 9-11. And there was this poor old lady, probably in her 90s with dementia. You could tell. She had nurses there and everything. You could tell she didn't know where that, where she was at. Right. And Tammy goes, oh, bless her heart. Look at the Mima. You know, and I said, you watch, babe. They're going to pull her out and pat her down. She goes, they would not. And sure enough. <laughs> oh, yeah, they will. We we get about halfway up to the, to the line. I look over and I go, look who's getting patted down. And she, it was the saddest thing. They were patting down this poor old lady. And then Tammy gets pulled out when we get through. And she's standing there with her arms up while they're patting her down. And she's going, Jeff, I haven't been touched like this and not kissed in my entire life. I go, keep it up, babe. Keep it up. We're not going to get out of here. I mean, they were getting ticked off with her. She thought it was funny. I go, it's not funny, Tammy. I said, these people are underpaid and they have too much power. So, yeah. Oh, my gosh. They're going to yeah. make your life miserable. They're going to pull you into the basement. I'm not going to see you for a week. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's amazing to me that TSA... They're they're a great example of, of 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 seeing how leadership works sometimes because there are airports there are a few airports that they are great and so I don't right. know who it is leading those teams but you know a lot of airports they are not great and uh, right. it's you know Pensacola where I fly out of they're great they have they have great leadership there. And those people are fast, they're polite, they're, you know, they right. smile, they laugh, you know, but God, there's some that you just think, oh, please, you know, it's just, it is just weird. So, Jeff, where have you, what have you done during this pandemic, epidemic, death plague? I mean, you're, you're like, well, this you know, is most my retirement. I, I said to Tam, I go, I've been forced into retirement for three months. And if this is what retirement is, I'm never going to retire. <laughs> Cause I've heard I, that I've done, I've done so much thinking yard work. You know, I, I have now a deep respect for the people I paid all these years to do my yard. Um, they work hard. <laughs> I've probably laid out six yards of mulch, six yards of mulch already. We cleaned a shed that hasn't been cleaned in two years. And, uh, the, the other day, Tammy came to me and said, um, I think it's time to start working on the inside of the house. Uh, we want to, I'm going to do drawers in the bedroom next week. So now I'm going to clean out drawers. I'm telling you, Andy, I got stuff, electronic stuff in my drawer and my nightstand that has vacuum tubes. That's how long they've been. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And I like them there. That's all, you know, it's like, just leave it alone. It's not hurting yeah. anybody. That's why it's in a drawer. It does out of sight, out of mind. I don't want to look at any of it. I started cleaning my office uh, a month ago, and I'm I'm nowhere near done. I because I'll pull get, books out. I started yeah, get, reading one of your books. I started oh, pulling out books. I go, oh, oh my god, these books. So I started reading that. I go, I forgot all about this. I, re I was reading Traveler's Gift. So anyway, ah, I, I went through that. Yeah, and uh, and then my favorite book of yours, uh, How Do You Kill uh, Eleven Million People? You know that Chipper uh, Holiday book. <laughs> yeah, let me tell let me tell you something. You know we released another uh, like a second edition of that where we added 
a bunch of stuff that the founding fathers, you know, letters from the founding fathers. And all. It released the second edition. Oh, and it came out right when the pandemic wow. hit. And so you talk about tanking a marketing program. You know, you, you right. have the news about the pandemic and you're trying to sell a book. How do you kill 11 million people? So we right. just, everybody just kind of quit. We said, yeah, never mind. Yeah, that's not a, uh, the, the, uh, the, the right title. You know. But, you know, um, that that um, that cleaning out, man, I, and I guess you got rid of your floppy disks and everything in your office. Well, so far, I got, you know, I still wanted to know what was on them. You know, it's like <laughs> I, I did. I was going, I wonder if anybody could transfer this stuff. I got hundreds of VHS tapes from me. I, too. I was look. I was watching one. I still had a player probably a year ago and I was watching one um, in my basement in my office and my son walked in. I think I was 27 years old when that tape was made. I'm 64 now. So I'm watching it. And my son who was 34 looks at that and he goes, who's that? And I said, "Uh, that would be your dad. He goes, no. And he walked (laughs) across the room and he looked at it and he looked at me. And he went, holy cow, how old are you? I go, probably six, seven years younger than you are now. And he goes, oh, my goodness. I said, son, I'm old. I started a long, long time ago, you know. And uh, wow. I'd love to get those transferred because they're yeah, taking I... up a lot of space and stuff. But um, I, got a friend that, I, I got a friend that does archiving. His company's an archiving company. And they've done uh, Muhammad Ali's estate. They've done Oprah's estate. Uh, uh, thing. <laughs> The, and I the, told him, I already, said, how much I, I would started, you charge me? To, how much would you charge me to do me? He goes, you can't afford me. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, was, I was fixing to say, you know, right when you said I, I have a friend whose company does archiving, I was like, oh, okay, then I, maybe you could tell me his name. And then you said Oprah and Muhammad Ali. And I'm like, never mind, never mind. I'm out of right. that. Yeah, out of that league. But I, I found a bunch of those things too. We moved in the studio, and I asked Matt, who's my my technology person, you know, I, yeah. I said, Hey, how do I see this? He said, well, you know, on a, on a VHS player. I'm like, okay, do you have one? He said, mm, no. I said, do they sell them? He said, no. I said, well, what, how am I going to do it? And he said, well, you can get them at Goodwill. Goodwill. I was just going to tell you Goodwill. Like, huh, right? Okay. I might have to do that. Hey, so what, let me, here, here's a, a, a question that I think would be interesting uh, for you to answer, just because you're—I don't consider you old, but you're—you know—you you are talking a lot about being. Uh, you know, you talked about your grandchildren, and you told us you're 64, which doesn't seem nearly as old to me as it used to. Um, right. But yeah. what what is it? What is it about comedy? Because I consider you not only the best, but I consider you a student of it because there's no way you could become the best if you don't know why it works as it does. So what is it about comedy that you know, maybe a couple of things that you know that you feel like the average person doesn't know? They don't They don't know what's going on when you're doing such and such. Well, I, I, it's funny. I, I, was, I, I, get, I get lost in places now, and um, my standard – recovery for that is I'll, I'll lose my place and then I'll, I'll, I'll go, you know, I'll tell the audience, I'll give them a little inside baseball. I said in my young days, cause I'm a storyteller while I was telling you a story, I was seven or eight lines ahead in my mind, right. knowing where I was going to go and where I was going to take you on the journey. I am now maybe six or seven words ahead in my mind <laughs> and uh and uh i said you know when you're when your netflix jams up and it starts spinning that's what my mind is doing right now while i'm talking to you <laughs> trying, to, <laughs> trying to get my way out of this trench that i've dug myself into and tammy said to me once she goes you know it really plays well with you at your age you know to to you know but they don't know that i really literally have lost my place i don't know where i'm at you know. By the by the way, Tammy is okay, right? I mean, I somehow we yeah. left that, and I didn't. Oh sure, she um, uh, again. She's 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 scared of this um, Corona thing. I mean, you know, and rightfully so. Um, sure. She's in the high risk 
Um, and we just want to get the serology test to find out if we're okay. But um, she, she had a terrible year. Uh, she had some surgery done in December, and then the, then this thing hit her uh, that knocked her on her rear end for a month. I mean, it just tore her up. And uh, 20 years ago, she went through breast cancer. So that chemo um, has has now deteriorated her bone structure and her lower and her teeth. So she had to get six teeth pulled. And we were going to Israel with Huckabee, Mike Huckabee. Uh, in February. So we go to the surgeon and we said, we asked like one question, if she gets it done now, will she have teeth by February? And we were asking about the permanent teeth that we're spending 40 grand. (laughs) Right. (laughs) right. So he goes, Oh, absolutely. No problem. Well, what they were talking about was some Jed Clampett whittled teeth that they put together. <laughs> she was so pissed off. By Andy, I'm telling you, man. Uh, she went to Israel. She wouldn't even put them in her mouth. She walked around for 10 days in Israel in front of all these strangers and stuff, people we didn't know with no teeth on her, her lower teeth. And she <laughs> hasn't had teeth because Corona hit now. Uh, when she got back, one of her posts that they put in got infected. So she had to get that yanked out. That, and, and tomorrow or today, she has an appointment finally since February to have that post looked at. And uh, now I just, I, I have to say, to, so she to says the people, 2020, 2020 sucks is what she says. Well, yeah, I, but I, I have to say to people listening who don't know your wife, I mean, the, the picture you've, <laughs> you've painted is not good. And so I just want people to know that Jeff is talking about, I mean, Tammy is gorgeous. This is this yes. tall, slim, dark-haired beauty. This is he's not talking mm-hmm. about some granny, you know, that looks like no. she's 95. I mean, this is No, not at and all. So, and uh, she's uh she's been a trooper, I'll tell you that. Well, I, you be, I would, you better I would have take been care of her. That, you better take care of her because for God's sake, she's half your act. She's half. She's three quarters. My kid, somebody once asked me what I did before I got married. I said I starved. <laughs> I had, I had nothing of interest to talk about. What do you think is funny now? I mean, do you do you do you think there are less things funny, or do you think that are you still seeing as much as you always saw? Well, I could tell you what, what I I don't find funny, and that's politics, um, social commentary. I'm I'm over it, you know. Um, it, it seems to get more and more condescending and it seems to be more of a statement of fact or opinion than a joke. You know, uh, I was just listening to some old George Carlin. If you get a chance by Carlin, somebody put out a, an entire set, everything he ever did. And it's got behind the scenes stuff. It's got club stuff that he taped. Um, it's an amazing set of, um, of Carlin's work. And you, you watch his, the way he talked about it. My favorite line of his was back when, remember when Muhammad Ali wouldn't go to go into the army? Right, right. Yeah. And that was huge. That was huge. You know, he said, uh, it was a conscientious objector. And he said, uh, you know, I won't go in. And Carlin's line to that was, he for Muhammad Ali was, I can't kill him, but I'll beat him up. <laughs> <laughs> now, see, to me, that's funny. I don't care, you know, today, because it's so polarized and opinionated, whoever felt that he was trashing, you know, whatever, they would have been offended. And, and you know, um, I think social media has become the uh, the new, uh, remember when they used to put people in the center of the square and shame them, yeah. you know, oh, yeah. and I yeah. think that's what it's become. So that that's something that I have to avoid. And, you know, um, uh, writing comedy, if you're going to do it daily, that's the easiest stuff to put pen to paper. Oh, yeah. The hardest stuff to do is kind of what to create new stuff. I call what I do coincidental comedy. Something happens and then I talk about it on stage as a storyteller. Well, you know, I've been in my house for three months, <laughs> you know, and going to the golf course. I mean, it, there's not a lot happening in my life that is fodder for comedy. Let me ask you this. What, what, can you give me an example? And I, I know this is putting you on the spot, but I will match you 
just to put myself on the spot too, but it, it, give me an example of something that you used to do that because of the way people are now, you don't dare do anymore. Boy, um, I've, I've rephrased things. I, I started back in the 90s, really the well, late 80s maybe, was when I started seeing a change um, in the way the audience responded to um, certain topics. Uh, certainly drunk driving was one of them. You know, I was an, I'm an alcoholic, so I, you know, you, you talk about what you know. So I had one of the, what I thought was one of the best drunk driving routines <laughs> you know, ever written, you know, and, um, uh, gradually had to stop doing that just because of the political correctness and the way people perceived, um, you know, making light of it, you know, and, uh, at the time I was telling it, I was sober. Uh, you know, what was the, what was the funniest line from it? What was the, what well, was, was, what the, was the, the gist of people... it was that I got, I got arrested for drunk driving when I wasn't even driving the car. I was in the side of an interstate trying to start my glove box when the police showed up, you know, <laughs> you know, and exact at that point in the evening, I was no menace to society whatsoever. There wasn't a chance of my car starting up and me wreaking havoc on a suburban neighborhood. <laughs> I was just a mindless drunk on the side of the road, but you know, and yeah, I had gotten out funny. to take a pee. I had gotten out to take a pee. I got in on the wrong side. So, but the uh, the last line of the routine was um, they give you a phone call. They don't care how drunk you are, because by law they have to give you a phone call. And like you know, people that want to hear from a you know a drunk at three o'clock in the morning. I said, so I just started playing "Mary Had a Little Lamb" on the touch tone phone. You know, beep, 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 you know, and uh, you dial, you know, it takes 26 numbers to play the whole song. Well, you're no longer in a 615 area code. And uh, I actually woke a guy up in Korea. And uh, he said to me, Oh, you drunk again, Jeff? So that became. That became <laughs> cultural appropriation, and I'm not allowed to do it. And it was funny. I did the story in Vegas once, and these three Asian men walk up to me after the show, and in broken English go, you uh, you do joke about Korean. And I'm thinking, oh, no, here we go. And he says, you know sound Korean. You sound Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that was so. – the, the Japanese was my – that's one I think about every now and then that I can't, I can't do anymore. That I, you know, back when I was doing, doing uh, colleges and doing, uh, you know, I, oh, I can't and, imagine and, today. Wow. Well, yeah, and I, I, I'll, you know, and I'm going to say ahead of time, I don't want, I don't want to hear anything about this. I don't want to get, I don't want to get any uh, emails. I don't want to hear anything. Okay, I didn't mean anything by it then, and right now I'm just using it as an example to my friend Jeff that we're talking <laughs> about comedy. Okay, I, I I don't think this I, I still don't think this is mean spirited or or anything. Um, but the, what I would say, uh, I, I would say, man, I just came back from Japan and it was awesome. Uh, everybody was nice. Uh, I got to eat like real sushi, and and I also got to go to Tokyo Disneyland, which was incredible. I, I don't know if, if you've been to Disneyland here, but Tokyo Disneyland was like just a million times better. No lines. I mean, no lines because really everybody was too short to get on the good rides. <laughs> <laughs> and but I I I had to quit doing that. You know, I because I, I, you know, people started kind of looking at me weird, and I, I so I was right. like, good grief, and I, but I, I think we're, I think we're way too sensitive. Well, I almost called. I have a new dry bar special called Honor Thy Wife. I almost called it. Don't send me an email. <laughs> um, and I, I have, I have a bit about waxing uh, that chest hair, and um, the. Um, about how painful it is. Right. And one of the lines is they, I said, we've lost our minds. We spend billions of dollars to have the hair ripped out of our chest by the root. 
that hurts. But we won't let our federal government drip water on the faces of terrorists. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that's and really I do the good. whole. I do this whole thing about. I think the CIA needs to open up a series of spas around the world. You know, and uh, <laughs> and uh, See, I that's... always I always close the bit with, and don't send me an email. You know, I have no idea what it's like. You know, it's just, I, and that's I, I say that like six times in my show now. But one of my favorite lines that I, I wrote and Tammy doesn't like it. So I'm, I'm, I'll throw this out to your listeners. You can comment on Andy's page there and I can do a poll. <laughs> uh, I talk about the uh, political correctness. Now they won't even grade English papers in public school with red ink because apparently <laughs> red ink is too traumatic for our children to witness on a paper. And I said, are you kidding me? I don't know about you geniuses, but my English papers came back looking a lot like OJ's driveway. So, <laughs> so Tammy hates the line. Tammy yeah. hates that. So I changed it for the for the taping to a crime scene. I like the OJ line, but uh, Tammy yeah, it's said more it's specific. Too harsh. Yeah, too harsh. Too know? harsh. And uh, and uh, I said, yeah, we've lost our uh, our sense of humor. I I just thought it was a funny line, but hey, I the, think I wrote uh, it. People can see all uh, all the stuff. I don't know if uh, a lot of people, or actually a lot of people know about dry bar comedy, but more people yeah. should. There's a free app that you can get. It's dry bar comedy. And right. um, and you can see, you've got a couple or three specials on there, don't you? Well, I got two. Yeah. Two. And the second one just came out. Um, and right, right when it was, it was supposed to be released in March. And... Um, we taped it in January and I was really excited about it. To me, it's the best work I've put on tape. And, um, that's saying a I, lot. Well, I've had, I, I had six months, uh, to open my, I opened my show with it for six months, uh, the, the same 25 to 30 minutes. So it was tight and, um, it was really good. And I was really looking forward to seeing the response on it. And then this whole thing happened and, they they called me and said we're going to delay it because the advertising revenue for all of the, you know the platforms that they put it on is just tanked because of all of this. So mm. anyway, they eventually they they just started releasing bits you know, bits of well, it. Well, you were right. You were right in the middle of a tour when this happened. Right. You were doing. Yeah. Uh, wasn't it the America I grew up in? That was your tour. That was a tour of the America I grew up in. That was based on the first dry bar special. Yeah. And, uh, just, uh, and it's not a judgment call, so don't send me an email, you know, it's just, <laughs> it's not a judgment. It's just an observation between just an generations. observation. Hey, right. you guys, you guys should really, now it's Jeff Allen comedy.com. It's not yeah. Jeff Allen.com. No, it's that would Jeff. be a porn portal. That's not yeah, a good one. That's right. That's <laughs> those poor Gaither people who have gone to. Uh, Jeff Allen dot com is, uh, but it's Jeff A L L E N comedy dot com, yeah. and some of the best. And, and this is, you know, I, I almost I I kind of hated it when uh, people said this uh, about me, but I, and here I am kind of saying it about you. But this this is family friendly stuff. It's not kid stuff. This is not, you know, this is not right. some little pablum thing it's just it doesn't have all the words in it your family can listen to it you know younger kids may not get everything but your family can listen to it and these are the best cds in fact jeff i don't know if you know this but i have like a stack of your cds that i keep in my office that i give I away did not know that. i did not and know that. I just absolutely stole them the last time I was with you, and uh, <laughs> I, I love them. But but I give it, and I tell people I say you want to hear some just some great stuff. And um, here's uh, I, I got two more questions. I know we're running out of time, but I, I got two more questions that I think are just kind of uh, f funny questions or good questions to ask somebody in your position. And one is is kind of a throwaway, but emo. Emo Phillips, is he real oh. or not? I just want to know from somebody else. I mean, I have never found anybody who has ever seen the guy go out of character. Well, it's funny you say that because when we first met, we go back 1978 when I started and I met him and I was so blown away by his um, talent uh, that um, I, I wanted to get to know him. And 
it was almost a year and a half before we got past hello. I go, hey, well, how you doing? He'd go, well, you know, and I'd walk away. He never broke character. And then one day I said, Emo, how you doing? And he goes, I'm doing okay, Jeff. You know, and then we actually had a conversation. <laughs> but did, but he, he, he said, but he was, I'm doing, did he say I'm doing okay, Jeff? Or did he say I'm doing okay, Jeff? Well, that's the way he, that's when I would walk away when he was, when he was doing the character thing. And um, he's an extremely, extremely bright man. Um, oh my I, God. I, he's, I heard he was a scholar on the Iliad and the Odyssey. I mean, I heard he was that knowledgeable of Homer's um, uh, work. Well, I, and, I um, think I've, I've thought forever. I thought he's either a, a genius or like mentally off, and he is is a savant. I, but I mean, yeah, and I don't, I don't know, know if you know this, but a number of years ago, GQ magazine on their cover, they, it, the cover said the seventy five greatest jokes of all time. And of course, I bought it, you know, thinking I, I got to see what these are. Emo really? had three of them, three of them, for God's sake. Was it the asthmatic one? Was one of them? I don't remember that one. Tell, Where, what, uh, tell me. He got he got mugged by a group of uh, asthmatics, and he goes, "Granted, I should have heard them in the bushes." <laughs> <laughs> he he just, yeah. I mean, he just kills yeah. me. To me, I, I, to me, the greatest. Emo joke, and I don't know if this was one of them, but I just think this is just so creative. Is he's he says, My nephew had a birthday the other day, and I said, For your birthday, I'll give you three wishes. And I grabbed him by the arm and I went, whish, 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 <laughs> and I put him down and said, Let that be a lesson to you about the dangers of homonyms. <laughs> I mean, that's just friggin' brilliant. I mean, good yeah. grief. I mean, that just yeah. intimidates me. Well, I got to tell you, the first time my sister saw him live, I was working with him in Chicago and um, she's laughing, I mean, howling for 20 minutes. And then she stops laughing. And about five minutes into it, I lean over and I go, what's going on? She goes, he's like that, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is not an act. <laughs> well, I, sh I shared a dressing room with him one time. We were doing, a, doing some television show. And you know the clothes he wears. Well, he wore those he, coming to the studio. He changed out of those into clothes that were just like those. In the dressing room, and the and the other right. weird emo story I have is going through the Operaland Hotel one time, and I was walking with Ricky Skaggs, and you know Ricky, right. and you know there's not a straighter laced person in the world. Ricky, great guy, and I'm walking with Ricky, and Ricky goes, "Oh my God, look at this," and I look, and here comes emo, and it's crowded and everything. Here's emo, and and I said. Oh, that's Emo Phillips. And he said, who? I mean, he didn't know. He just saw saw this guy, and you know how he looks. Right. And and so Emo's walking toward us, and and he's wearing, uh, you know, hard shoes with no laces in them, uh, right. plaid pants that they're way too high, and pajama bottoms coming out the bottom of them, and right. a pajama top and a trench coat. He's wearing a trench coat. He's got his hands in the pocket of the trench coat. And in Nashville. So, in Nashville, yeah. And so, so in the Opryland Hotel. And so I, I said, Emo. And he looks over and he goes, Well, Andy Andrews, how in the world are you? And and he comes right. over and, and I said, Emo, this is Ricky Skaggs. Ricky is <clears throat> Emo Phillips. And Ricky reaches his hand out to shake his hand. And Emo keeps his hand in inside the pocket of the trench coat and shakes Ricky's hand through the pocket. <laughs> I thought Ricky was just going to, I did. I right. did, I mean, he, he hadn't, cause you know, if you don't know who emo is, you would think, right. I don't know what you'd think, but yeah. anyway, it's nice to know you've had a good conversation with you. All right, here, last question, buddy. And, and I also, man, I love talking to you. I just ha have a great time talking to you. I Thank you. And, blast. and uh, I want you to come do the Blue Plate special sometime. Uh, th this It's a live thing we're doing, and it's, you know, streams live on what? On Facebook, YouTube. 
what else, Matt? Instagram and Twitter. Yeah. And all at the same time. And it's getting great numbers and we're having a good time. I want you to do that. But here, here is a, a good last question for you. What, what is it? You tell me something that you've done in the past that you may still think it's funny, but it just it just didn't work. It just and you 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 really kind of still think it's funny, but it just didn't work, and so you don't do it anymore. Anything oh, I don't, like I don't, I don't stop doing it. I I'll tell you, I know exactly what you. What you cram it, it right down their throat. <laughs> well, I keep doing it. Tammy hates it. She she's like my. Uh, never pulls any punches she goes i don't know why you keep doing it i do a story about i do a story about um when we first moved to the the little town we live in in tennessee we couldn't it was before siri was born and there was no gps and we actually (laughs) we couldn't find an address we were looking for a house that we were going to look at to rent and uh as we were driving down the street there was this family of four in in the middle of an activity I, i have to admit i'd never seen before they were on the front lawn, burning the family couch. <laughs> and I said, as we pulled up, um, I, I noticed that they, it's like they had never seen fire before. It was like they, their mouths were agape. They were all staring at the couch, you know, just in this <laughs> trance. So the father didn't see me roll my spare tire up to him. And I said, look, wheel. <laughs> <laughs> So I did this fire wheel joke and Tammy goes, nobody gets it. Nobody likes it. Just stop doing it. I go, shut up. I like it. And I'm doing it. That's it. I tell this whole story about a homeowners association, all of that, just to get to that fire wheel thing. Because my, my like tag on all of that is there's no homeowners associations around here. And Tammy says, there's no conscience around here. Look at that. (laughs) It's like the, this toxic waste coming off this couch. And we've since burned our own couch in our backyard. So uh, we've, uh, we love life, Tennessee. Life, life comes around, doesn't it? It does. Man, thank you so much. Jeff Allen And uh, go to Drive Our Comedy and get the free app. Jeff, yeah. you, are, you are the best. And by that, I don't thank you, just, Andy. that's not just an opinion. That is like just a flat fact. So you guys, if you haven't heard Jeff, which is, there might be some of you out there, uh, he's like every other person on um, Sirius XM. They'll play somebody, then they'll play Jeff, then they'll play somebody else, then they'll play Jeff. Um, but but man, I, I am uh, such a great admirer of you. I mean, I'm not so much a fan as I am a great admirer of Jeff the person and and your your act, and so. Well, appreciate you. you, buddy. Thank you for being with us. Well, let me let me heap a little uh, praise on you as well. I, I um, you invited me down. Go ahead. Go here. ahead. You, you, we we won't edit it out. Go ahead. Okay. You invited me down <laughs> to, to to your home uh, for for uh, a number of days, and uh, that was just an, an honor to spend that time with you. And and I I remember admiring your Kamado Joe grill, and. Um, we were in uh, different financial situations back then, Tammy and I. And um, I don't think it was four days when I got back home in my driveway. Shows that shows up this eight hundred pound um, <laughs> Kamada Joe grill that is uh, in the middle of my deck, and I just grilled a two inch ribeye the other night on there. And there's not a time. I put wood in that grill that I don't think about you and our friendship. Wow. Not Thank one you, time. Buddy. Andy, that was uh, one of the greatest gifts I've ever been ever given. That was uh, well, such a shock and what a, what a, what a pleasant thing. And, and, it, and it's made me be aware of when I give gifts now, I want people to think of me when they use those gifts, you know, because I do. I think of you every, there's not a time I lift that hood up and I go, yeah, I wonder what Andy's doing today. You know, I start pouring and and, uh, uh, thank you so much. It's just a a great gift. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be able to do it. It it is, isn't it? Oh my gosh. And um, please tell Tammy, hey, and take care of your grandbabies. Really take care of Tammy. And uh, I love you, Jeff. And I'll talk to you soon. Love you too. All right, man. Bye God bye. bless you.
I'm Andy Andrews, the professional noticer, harnessing common sense and wisdom to plow through challenges all the way to an answer for you. Hey, do you seek wisdom in any particular place? You know, it's the second decision in the traveler's gift. I will seek wisdom. And it's a, it's, this is an action uh, command. You know, you have to seek it. And allow me to suggest Wisdom Harbor dot com as a great location to start. That's wisdom, H-A-R-B-O-U-R dot com. And uh, there are so many different docks at Wisdom Harbor that cover so many different areas. This is great for your for your kids, for your schools, for your business, uh, for your family. So many people are using it for their business to create a feeling of team and to create a cultural literacy for for their employees, which just makes them more valuable publicly and uh, as you're branding and selling with your with your company. So uh, wisdomharbor.com. There's a 30-day free trial on there right now, and no excuse not to go. Wisdom, H-A-R-B-O-U-R.com. Okay, I'm the professional noticer, and I think that'll do it for this week. Get us out of here, Matthew. So, ladies and gentlemen, and to the boys and girls who aspire to become ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of another episode of The Professional Noticer. In a world where common sense has become a superpower, I'm harnessing the mental energy I have for you, seeking wisdom, making observations, and endeavoring to answer tough questions in a way that will empower your family and your business. I'm Andy Andrews. Until next week, smile while you talk. Be careful breathing anyone else's air and make sure you have a positive answer to the question, how's it going? And so, until next week, goodbye. This episode of The Professional Noticer was produced by Matt Limpert. The Noticer theme written and performed by Sugarcane Jane. Fish scale canvases provided by Twinkle and Smoke of Beverly Hills. Additional financial consideration provided by Jeff Allen's HelmetsForYourFace.com. At HelmetsForYourFace.com, we're ready for the big wave of face shielding technology that the masses will be clamoring for in no time. Customize your helmet by first picking your shape. Do you want to look like a bug, a rabbit, Darth Vader, or Jeff himself? We've got hundreds of molds to choose from. Next, pick your color and exterior sticker decals. You want to be a pink stormtrooper with the number 72 on the back of your head so everyone knows it is you wherever you go? You have the creative freedom to bring anything to reality. Finally, pick your voice augmentation and speaker size. Would you prefer to have a voice exactly one octave above your normal voice? Or exactly one octave below your normal voice? Or do you want a small set of speakers so that everyone has to lean in to hear you speak? Once again, you have the creative freedom to make anything happen. Get ready to never show your face in public again, but display your uniqueness for all to see. That's helmetsforyourface.com.